subscribe now. EU debates. Thank you very much for welcoming me back to Princeton. Distinguished members of the Princeton faculty and administration and most uh, importantly, dear students. So indeed, uh, this is the United Nations General Assembly week right now. And you can imagine one dominant topic wasn't is the war that Russia unleashed against Ukraine. It was the 24th of February when Russia invaded Ukraine and brought war back to Europe. I visited Kyiv for the first time since the beginning of the war, around about five to six weeks after the invasion started. And I went to the town of Butsha. Before the war, Butsha was a quite friendly suburb on the outskirts of Kyiv. It has been occupied by Russian troops. Two days before I went to Butsha, it has been liberated by Ukrainian armed forces. And when I went there, I saw mass graves. I saw the body bags lying there, men, women, children. I saw these brutal scars of missiles and bombs that have been aimed deliberately at residential areas, hospitals, schools, kindergartens. So I basically saw firsthand the reality of Putin's war. And last week, as you said, Andy, I was again in Kyiv. And I was in Irpin, also on the outskirts of Kyiv. You still see the scars of the bombing of houses and hospitals and schools. I spoke, for example, to school children and why we were speaking. When I visited that school, there was a missile alarm, so we had to go to the shelter. And they told me it's the third time today that they go to the shelter. That is their daily experience. But I saw also that life has come back to Kiev. The streets were filled with people. The shops were open. People in Kiev tried to win their life back. The Ukrainian army is making impressive advances, advances liberating many towns and villages, and forcing the Russian armies, army to retreat. Of course, I know that this all needs consolidation. But the success of the last days is lifting spirits and not only the Ukrainian ones. I know that some are calling to stop the fighting. But I must say the reality is as follows. If Russia stops fighting, the war is over. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no more Ukraine anymore. Much is at stake, not just for Ukraine, but also for Europe, for the international community, and for the global order. Russia has invaded Ukraine with the goal to wipe the country from the map. That's what Putin says and writes. So Ukrainians are fighting for their survival, but they are also fighting for global values. And this is not only a war that Russia has unleashed, unleashed against Ukraine. This is a war on our values. This is a war on the rules-based international order. This is an attack on the UN Charter. I mean, Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations. We should not forget. This is trampling on the UN Charter. And this is a war about autocracy against democracy. And I tell you, many, many worldwide are watching very precisely what the outcome is. From day one on, the United States and the European Union and many other friends have stood at Ukraine's side with weapons. And it's amazing to see the bravery of the Ukrainians fighting for their survival with funds with hospitality on the European Union side for more than 8.1 million refugees in seven months, and with the toughest sanctions the world has ever seen. Let me tell you that these sanctions have only been possible because of a very, very close cooperation with our friends in the United States. As you said, I've been in politics now around about 20 years. 
14 of them in the government, uh, government of Angela Merkel, never ever have I experienced such an intense, trustful and detailed cooperation with the White House. And therefore, I think the, the saying is right, when you face a crisis, you know who your true friends are. Since last year already, it was around Christmas, New Year, we started when Putin had started, as you might remember, to deploy 10,000 of troops to encircle Ukraine. Our teams have, been started, have started to work on the sanctions to align the European system with the American system. They are very different, but the effect of the sanctions should be the same. And we do not want extraterritorial effects, but sovereign effects from the European Union, but all the other G7 members that joined us, and of course the United States. And this intense work over week then had as consequence that when the invasion started on day two, day four, day six, we could immediately deliver three very heavy packages of sanctions that are unfolding the effect right now. The sanctions are biting. Russia has tried everything to camouflage the effects, and as this is not a free country, you can twitch and turn around facts and figures into what you want them to be, or you can say what you want and hide what you want. But if you look at the financial sector in Russia, it's an, on life support now. Russia's industry is in tatters. It's very interesting to see the military complex because the military complex now has a very hard time to replenish what is necessary for the armed forces because the updated technologies are missing. These are coming from our side and no more delivered as a ban on the exports. The spare parts are missing. So you observe now that the Russians are cannibalizing their refrigerators and their dishwashers to get semiconductors they can use for the military complex. Basically, the Kremlin has put Russia's economy on the path of oblivion. And I want to make it very clear that the sanctions are here to stay. This is the time for resolve and not for appeasement. The same is true for the financial support to Ukraine. So far, Europeans have provided more than 19 billion euros in financial assistance since the beginning of the war. And that is without counting our military support. The message is, we are in for the long haul. I grew up in a divided country. I was lucky. I was born in West Germany, in the western part of Europe, in a free and democratic country. I vividly remember the times of the Iron Curtain, when I was your age, the student's age, when we wanted to drive to the island of West Berlin that was surrounded by the GDR, I remember still today the feeling of being terrified when you were driving on the corridor through the death zone because you knew one false move and there is no rule of law anymore to protect you. So I remember this feeling very well what the Iron Curtain and the wall and the death zone were all about. I also remember, of course, in 1990, the jubilant days when the Iron uh, Curtain came down, when the wall in Berlin came down, and when the countries behind the Iron Curtain broke free. Indeed, the Baltics, Poland, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Prague, Czech Czechia, you name it, so many others. Today, there is the same wind of change that is once again blowing across the continent. Because Ukraine has now applied for membership in the European Union. And with their decision to apply for the candidate status of Ukraine joining the European Union, they have very clearly chosen the path of freedom. And with our decision to grant them candidate status, we have chosen to stand by Ukraine as long as it takes. This war will change Europe and the world fundamentally. Take energy. I want to speak a little bit about energy. At the beginning of the war, 
Europe was heavily dependent on Russian fossil fuels. Coal, oil, gas. 60% of the Russian budget's revenues at that time was from fossil fuels. So you can imagine how important the fossil fuel export was and is. Putin has built very strategically and later on used our dependency to blackmail us, basically to suffocate us, with lowering already in hindsight, I see it, the gas supply last year's to the storage to make sure that we have not enough gas in the storages to make it through the winter and slowly but surely cutting the gas supplies to one member state after another. At the moment being, he prefers to flare the gas, that is literally burning the gas, instead of delivering as he should if you look at the contracts. I guess that he obviously thought that he could intimidate us and divide us, but let me tell you just the opposite is the case. This blackmailing has really united us and it is a turning point because we have decided as a European Union we will end our reliance on Russian fossil fuels. Meanwhile, Europe has banned Russian coal imports completely. We've been winding down and are winding down the oil imports from Russia down to 10% by the end of the year. Gas is interesting, let me give you three figures. If you look at the overall global pipeline gas demand, 75% was the demand of the European Union on global pipeline gas supply, 75%. So we are a huge client, very important. Half of it was import from Russia. Today we're down on Russian imports to 25%, one quarter is left over. How are we doing this? We are diversifying away from the Russian supply towards other suppliers that are democratic, friends, and trustworthy. First hand, of course, our friends in the United States. I closed an agreement with President Biden on LNG imports that really, really helped us and saved us in these difficult times. It's very successful. The second point that we are doing besides diversifying away is saving energy. The energy that is not being used is good energy. We save it to the storage for the coming winter. Of course, this comes at a price. So let me tell you that we all feel that the global energy market is very tight. The whole Russian supply is missing. So we are demanding energy on the global market. Therefore, the global market is really tight. Energy prices are skyrocketing, as you observe in Europe. This is a heavy burden on people's and businesses' shoulders. We're taxing now the windfall profits of electricity producing companies to have a targeted support for vulnerable households and vulnerable businesses. We are doing all this not only because it is necessary, but also because we know that this is the way to dry out Putin's war chest. And we know that we are doing this because with energy independence and energy freedom comes greater power to defend the global rules. This is the immediate response. But there's of course a mid-term and long-term response. Ultimately, the best way to get rid of fossil fuels is a massive investment in renewable energy. Every kilowatt hour that we are producing electricity from sun, from wind, from hydropower, from geothermal, from biomass, from green hydrogen, you name it, is not only good for the climate, it's also good for the climate, that's the most important, but it makes us independent. It's homegrown, it's security of energy supply, it creates good jobs at home. If you look at the price today of solar and wind energy, it's cheaper by now than fossil fuels. This is why, for example, we are investing heavily in offshore wind parks. The biggest one worldwide is now uh, starting in the North Sea. When it's ready to go, it will heat 50 million European homes throughout the whole year. So in sum, 
the era of Russian fossil fuels in Europe is coming to an end. <clears throat> and this is a big geopolitical shift because if you look at the map, if I'm the European Union, here's Russia. The demand and supply from Russia is coming from end, to an end. This demand from the European Union will now switch towards the global south. Because if we do it right, we're not only diversifying to other gas or fossil fuel suppliers, but we massively now invest in renewable energies in regions where there are the resources in abundance. If you look at the other side of the Mediterranean in the European Union, it's the African continent, sun, wind, partially hydropower in abundance. And if we invest in the infrastructure, we no, do not only gain freedom from the back blackmail that we have experienced with Russia, but we are also fighting, uh, fighting the right cause against climate change. The fight against climate change is the biggest one. And I want us, the European Union and the United States, to be allies in that fight. Global warming is the real crisis that is over overshadowing everything. We know that climate change is man-made. The body of evidence is overwhelming. So it's us. The impact is tangible. You know it. Floods, droughts, wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, melting glaciers, rising sea levels. I had yesterday a bilateral meeting with the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Three quarter of the country is inundated. Three quarter of the country. Climate change. It's nothing but climate change. So it's very bad. But there is a glimpse of hope. Because if it's true that climate change is man-made, we can do something about it. That's the good news and the bad news. And that's what the European Green Deal is all about. When I came into office in 2019, this was the first initiative I took. Our strategy, the European Green Deal, wants to transform our economy so that we preserve and restore nature. We need to decarbonize our economy. We need to move towards a circular economy. We need to develop a way of life and work that gives our planet a real fighting chance for the next generation, for you. So we have, as the European Union, cast in law our goals for 2030 and climate neutrality 2050. We want to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And we are the first highly industrialized continent that has put a concrete plan how we want to get there on the table. So pieces of legislation, legal acts to make this transformational change happen. What are the principles? The first one is CO2 needs a price because nature cannot pay the price anymore. Those who emit CO2 must pay. Therefore, we have put in place an emission trading system. If you want to emit CO2, you pay. If you want to avoid that, you go and innovate into clean technologies. Second principle, the transition has to be just, otherwise it will not happen. So we invest massively to support the regions that have to leapfrog forward, for example, coal uh, abating regions that have to leapfrog forward into completely different industries. And we have a social climate fund to support the small incomes and the vulnerable businesses that have no leeway to adapt to cleaner mobility, to insulated houses, to better heating systems, and all what is necessary to change. The third principle is we need massive investments in innovation and infrastructure. That's the point where next generation EU comes into play. I called it next generation EU because we raised on the capital markets 800 billion euros to invest in projects that will serve the next generation. 360 billion of these will go into projects of the European Green Deal. And I'm very glad that the United States are matching that now. I was happy to hear that the climate package is, I think it was $369 billion going into green projects, climate change fighting projects. 
The fourth principle is, and that follows from it, that global warming is a global one, a global task. Europe is responsible for 9% of the global emissions. We need everyone on board. And therefore, I very much welcome President Biden's strong commitment also to become climate neutral by 2050. And last but not least, the fifth and last principle is we consider the European Green Deal as a huge business opportunity, our new growth strategy. If we master the turnaround, those who have innovated and developed the clean solutions will be the front runners. They will have the first mover advantage. And then the whole world will be asking for their technologies. This is the reason why we have to prepare now if we want to be competitive in the future. This brings me to one afterthought. I've been speaking about energy, I've been speaking about dependency, the European Green Deal, or fighting climate change. The green transition, but also the digital transition, I must say, will massively increase our needs of raw materials. Lithium for batteries, silicon metal for chips, rare earth to produce magnets, for example, for electric vehicles. Demand for those rare uh, raw materials and rare earth will presumably at least double till 2030. The good news is that shows that the European Green Deal and the green transformation overall worldwide is progressing fast. The not so good news is one country dominates the market. Out of the 30 critical raw materials today, 10 are mostly sourced in China. And China basically controls the global processing industry. Almost 90% of rare earth, 90, and 60% of lithium are processed in China. We have to avoid falling into the same trap and dependency as we did with oil and gas. So we have to be very careful not to replace one dependency, one old one, by a new one. And that brings me back to where I started democracy versus autocracy. Each of our democracies is very unique and different because ultimately they are depending on, or they have been shaped by our people, by our history, by our backgrounds, our cultures, our constitutions. But in the very end, democracies in all forms come down to one single point, and that is it gives people a voice. It gives the ability to change things at the ballot box. In democracies, we even fight for the right to be against us. That's democracy. To be able to speak your mind, to change your mind if you want to, to be free to be yourself, so that if you are different from the majority, you are equal before the law. It is the accountability to all and not only to those who have voted for you. That's democracy. A system where power is given and taken away by the citizens and framed by checks and balances. And we see what the alternative is. At the beginning of this year, Russia and China declared an unlimited friendship. And despite the fact that cracks have appeared in the last days, both continue to aim for a fundamentally different vision of the future. I believe we have to take this challenge very serious. We need to defend the open and inclusive international order, both in the United States and the European Union and beyond. Those who were lucky enough to be born and raised in democracies, like me, can often take the democracy just for granted. It was always there. I always lived in a democracy. But now I realize 
It's not going to be here if I do not stand up for this democracy. And those who have lived in autocracies and authoritarian regimes will know all too well how precious freedom is. In Europe, we have learned that we must always work on improving democracy because we know how quickly and how devastatingly history can change. We know that the opponents of democracy today are using sophisticated new tools, modern technologies to oppress and manipulate through systematic disinformation. Disinformation is not a partisan issue. It is a societal one because it seeks to muddy the waters so much that truth and facts become impossible to distinguish from lies and falsehood. So in the very end, democracy needs us, each and everyone, explicitly. And by that, I want to address you, the students, the faculty members, the administration here in this room. You have the privilege to study and work in an institution that is based on a long tradition to unveil truth through critical discourse, to evidence-based research, respect for facts and figures, the understanding of history. And these are the tools and the ingredients to dismantle disinformation. You have a mission. As politi politicians, we have a mission too. But you have a mission. Or in the words of Princeton's informal motto, in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.